Uh, hey, everybody. I recently added videos to this PowerPoint, so I'm definitely tempting fate today. Um, so I'm ready to start. We're good? Yes? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming to advance environmental storytelling in spider right of the shrouded moon. Please silence your cell phones. Please fill out the survey at the end that you'll get an email. So uh, my name is Randy Smith. And I've been working on games that are not per se story games, where the focus tends to be on gameplay instead. So gameplay designer is one of the hats I wear. But I liked putting story into these games anyway, and oftentimes I did this with environmental storytelling. So let's start with the story of Spider, the secret of Bryce Manor, a.k.a. Spider One. In this game, you play a spider who proceeds from one room to the next of an abandoned mansion, leaving the place covered in cobwebs. The props in the environment convey who once lived here and what happened to them. Because you're a spider, you can get into every little nook and cranny and have a better perspective on the story than any one of its human players. And it's a story of domestic drama and mystery. There's a love triangle and sibling rivalry and betrayal and a suicide and a kooky grandpa character who hid the family fortune from uh, beyond the grave using a puzzle. So let's uh, locate Spider in the space of all possible stories. Um, there are absolutely no words, text, or dialogue. Uh, other games of this quality include Another World and Ico and 30 Flights of Loving. This is actually an exaggeration, as we'll see. Um, the story is extremely nonlinear, and what I mean by that is that the storyteller doesn't know what information is going to be presented to the audience, nor in what order. Another game like this is Her Story. Uh, there's these like tattered fragments that come at the audience in a way that's not under the author's control. Environmental storytelling is usually at least somewhat nonlinear, unless you're controlling the camera and really forcing the user to stare at and witness and understand each little piece of story data. So the Back to the Future opening title sequence is a wonderful example of that. And lastly, it's like what I call a dead story or archaeology gameplay. Uh, there's no living characters present. It's con you know, the story has concluded before the game actually begins. It leads to the question, what happened here? Uh, this tends to have a lonely vibe, as is also pretty common in environmental storytelling, which comes from the player, I believe, thinking a lot about people, but there's no people present. So this is a good time to clarify that. When I talk about the story for Spider, I'm specifically talking about the linear narrative of the NPCs. I'm not talking about the PC's on-screen emergent narrative or world building or puzzle design. Those are also parts of story, uh, sorry, of Spider, but not this presentation. So there's some things I really like about Spider's story, including the fact that it's asynchronous and non-intrusive. That means that it'll never interrupt the user like a cinematic would. Uh, the user can absorb the story while they're engaged in other things like gameplay. It's a, oop, I never fixed this. It's a pull, not push story. So just go ahead and read the opposite of what that says. Um, <laughs> So what this means is that the story is not foisted onto the player, and so the player takes the initiative to mine the story out of the game themselves, and this leads to a much higher level of investment on the part of the player. And those two points together also mean that you can kind of monitor the player becoming interested in the story during playtest. Uh, the player has a sense of ownership over the story. Um, and uh, what that means is that the player's job is to form their own interpretation of Spider's story. And my goal as the designer is to foster different possible interpretations. I, I like maintain the one true version, but that's only to make sure that all the clues land and the story isn't inherently self-contradictory. And lastly, it's a fresh way to tell stories. Like her story would not be as memorable if you watched all the videos in chronological order. And in a, in a similar way for Spider's story, it has like plenty of archetypes and like hoary old chestnuts and stuff. But um, it's the other qualities that actually make it unique. It's like literally never required that the player follow along at all. If you just want to play the gameplay part, that's totally valid. And it's also told from the point of view of a character who cares nothing about the story. Like the spider is only motivated by building webs and eating insects. But we happen to know that there's a human player who's sort of like watching over the spider's shoulder who might be drawn in by the human drama they witness. Uh, but we only give that human the tools to express spider-like behaviors. Like, you can't actually respond to the story. And it's this very elusive quality, one of the most distinct parts of appreciating Spider's story. And we really push this separation as far as we can. So that was Spider 1, and then some years later, it's time to start working on the story for Spider, Right of the Shrouded Moon, a.k.a. Spider 2. Um, and we wanted this to be a leveling up in all possible ways. There wasn't going to just be one measly old puzzle. There's going to be many puzzles that would add up to this hidden mega puzzle. Um, we wanted to do more with that layer of separation between the spider and the player, like kind of blurring the boundary between the game and real life. But mostly I'm going to be talking about the first two. We wanted there to be more characters, more intertwined plot threads. 
Um, the way I approach things, like designing good characters or drawing inspiration, that's, it's very similar to how I'd author a story in any other game or other media. So I'm not going to cover these things very much. Instead, I'm going to focus on stuff specific to environmental storytelling. Um, and where I like to start is by brainstorming what I call anchor moments. And these are specific story beats visualized as they would appear on screen. So they have to have the right tone. I'm hoping for some really good emotional strength to come out of them. Uh, and they need to fit the format by being easily read for information. And so I don't necessarily know how these moments are going to fit yet, but they seem like they might be right for the game. And then I proceed to this uh, bottom-up process followed by a top-down process using those anchor points. So what do I mean? Um, it, the low level is the anchor moments and any other actual on-screen game content, but the high level stuff is more like plot lines and themes and characters. So basically, once there's enough low level moments, the high level structure, structure starts to emerge, and then you think about that and use that to drive back downwards, and it goes back and forth, exploring and developing possibilities. So for example, here we have uh, the anchor moment of a locket that's been thrown down the well, so that suggests this is a story about heartbreak, and what else might convey that? Well, here's a wedding ring that was lost in the drain uh, that was sort of derived from this, and players report these are both like strong moments for them. In Spider-2, this character seemed to be shaping up to be too much of a, like a mustache-twirling vaudevillian cliché, so how can we give him some more dimension? So we can see here that in his private moments, he plays the lute while gazing at a portrait of his beloved. Um, and that had this cool idea that you were going to follow some footprints, uh, but which character this is or even what plot line it's associated with, I'm not sure yet. So why do I do low level first? It's because even for the most artfully structured work, it's the on-screen moments that are the content. The structure provides a substance and meaning, but it's invisible. It's kind of a candy versus vegetables thing, and I believe that both are important. And one of the keys here is being able, you know, willing to cut the good anchor moments and other amazing ideas that just aren't fitting in. So focus on cohesion, not kitchen sinking it. Being your own editor. So I have a technique I call histogramming, which sounds fancy, but really just means counting how many of the planned levels are devoted to which topics. So for example, I can see how much stage time each character is getting relative to that character's prominence. Uh, I also use it for things like themes, like making sure we still have enough relatable domestic drama and it's not all like secret societies and hidden passages. Um, so it's kind of like this left brain analysis which helps confirm we're building the right content. What can we cut? What might we need to add? And there's another technique where I sort of gather all the elements of a particular thread and think about how the player would logically connect them into a story, which is pretty standard. Um, but the opposite direction is a more careful one, which would be like listing every inference the player would have to make in order to, to draw, in order to understand the story, and then connecting each of those steps with a specific piece of game content. In both cases, the goal is sort of proving the story can be understood. And this is my best answer to how to design for non-linear non storytelling because you can examine each step and think about when they're going to present themselves to the player. Um, but another really good answer is, hey, play test and refine. Users will just tell you when they're confused. And when they are, it's usually the case that one of those steps is either missing or it's badly conveyed. So let's go into the shipping game and take a look for major things to talk about. We're going to start with the very beginning of the carriage house, which is kind of our training level. Um, and here we see a lot of establishing material and symbolism. So the first thing that happens is the spider hatches from an egg. Uh, we actually see the spider go through a full life cycle from birth to death, which is important because the human characters are struggling to achieve immortality, and by contrast, the spider does achieve it, but using natural means. And the better to draw such parallels, it was also important to me that the spider be born under the symbol of the secret society, thrust into the same circumstances as the humans. Uh, we also see anachronisms like, hey, there's license plates from cars versus this antique carriage. It's meant to establish that this is a modern time and it has a strong connection to its past, much like Vermont, my home state, which inspired many parts of the game. And you can also find a hidden stash of valuables plus some weird little tinctures in the carriage house. This is meant to be a reward for exploring, but it's also a story hook, like who put this here and what were they up to? Moving on to the entrance hall, the next level. Uh, we're going to spend some time talking about this portrait, which internally we call The Arrival. There's a distressed pregnant young woman who's being taken in by an older couple, the woman of which is receiving her joyfully, but the man standing a little bit apart, he seems annoyed. Uh, we see their names below on a plaque. The man's name is D.V. Blackbird, and the S.B. Blackbird is the other half of the elderly couple, and the pregnant woman is L.S. Bryce. L.S.'s arrival in the house is the inciting incident of Spider-2 from which everything else unravels. 
but how do we know that this isn't like a departure? Like maybe they're showing off their shame to servant girl or something. So uh, partially that's conveyed through body language. We see SB's gathering embrace. And we also added luggage at one point to help convey a sense of arrival. Like we wanted to, her to seem like she's from someplace else. So this portrait features numerous connections for the players to draw, including this window and this hat. We laid it on pretty thick in this first level because we were trying to help players realize what their job is. Because make no mistake, Understanding spider story requires what is essentially detective work, even if the story isn't detective themed. Uh, and this is partially due to the nonlinear, no text format. It's just really difficult to read complicated stuff like character motivations and causality. So we work really hard to help the players understand by designing clues that are easily read and combined with other clues. So coming back to this portrait, let's look at some more examples. This piece of luggage appears in a later level. Uh, and in that same room with the luggage, we find this purse in this necklace, so this establishes that the room is LS's bedroom. And nearby in that same level, there's this earring, because we know it's her bedroom, we can assume this is her earring, so that when we see the matching earring in an even later level, we know that LS is the person who is here, strapped to this weird experimental bed thing. And it so happens that all four pixels of her earring in the portrait happen to not contradict those earrings. Now some of you may also draw on the connection between these red shoes, the other of which shows up at this kidnapping scene, that's chloroform on the table above there. And together, this is supposed to express that she was kidnapped in the basement and then brought to the experimentation table. Um, this idea of connections is the most prominent tool in spider spider's storytelling technique. So when you see this cane and bowler hat in a later level, I want you to know that this is DV's place, and I want you to process everything in that level with respect to him. It's his stuff, it's things he was doing. Uh, portraits provide a rare opportunity because we have few of them to connect the props to a name and a face and all the humanity and character those convey. So I try to wring a lot of use out of each portrait. And the entrance hall also contains candy wrappers, which are a calling card. They're associated with a particular character. You can kind of sprinkle them around wherever you want to establish this character has been there. And they're a little bit more effective because you're essentially drawing a connection to that same prop over and over instead of having to notice and track individual unique props like clothes. Uh, these guys are also interactive. You can kind of bounce them around a little bit so it calls more attention to them. There's other calling cards in the game like uh, the child character. If he's been somewhere, he tends to leave toys around. Um, now this is a whole lot of stuff for just one level, it's one of the first levels of the game, but it's not intended to be understood on the first pass, not at all, much more like repeat visits. And again, players don't have to do any of this, they can just totally ignore the story. Moving on to the parlor, this is a scene of quiet domestic life for the elderly couple. The left side is his, the right side is hers, that ordering is reflected in the portrait above the hearth, and it's later preserved in their bedroom in terms of which side of the bed they sleep on. Um, so let's go in and examine each character's props. For DV, on the left, we can see he's the guy with the candy wrappers. Um, we see his books, which uh, seem to be about things like engineering and math. And along with the screwdriver and this gizmo, it's meant to establish him as the inventor of the inventions we're going to see later in the game. And we see that he's drinking not whiskey, but maybe that's like Kool-Aid, which along with candy suggests some kind of childishness. And over here on the right with SB, looks like she's just sewing like a very innocuous housewife. Um, there's a reveal about her later, but to make it work, you have to start by setting up the wrong impression. Zooming on that portrait, DV looks like an uptight fuss bucket, which combined with the Kool-Aid and candy and genius levels of invention, inventing, that pretty much sums up his character. And there's some power dynamics here too. DV is standing up and he almost seems to be holding down his seated wife. But once the player learns how headstrong and wild his wife is, they'll get a second read on this the next time they visit. This is more about what DV wishes were true than what's really true. And lastly, P. Fen, the guy in the background standing apart, uh, the hope was to establish him as a servant, but since servants aren't normally in family portraits, uh, this was confusing for players. Off in a corner, we see where a child drew on the walls. This is meant to indicate an invasion of the couple's quiet domestic life. And in the parlor, we find our second hidden stash of treasures and tinctures. So let's take a look at this recurring pattern. Um, the treasures are supposed to look valuable, like somebody is stealing. Uh, for a little while in our game, they just looked like normal plates and silverware, too much like that. Um, so people are like, I don't know, somebody does want to do the dishes, so they hit them. Um, so to solve this, we really beefed up their, their value appearance, and we also made sure the first ones in the carriage house especially looked super treasury. Uh, the reason they're plates and silverware is because these are items a butler would have access to. In a later level, we can find the mother load of all these items, and the name of this level is Butler's Quarters, which establishes that there is a butler, and players tend to figure out who it is using process of elimination, if nothing else. And these caches are implemented as secrets 
in the sense of a formal interaction in the spider games. The way a secret works is they start covered up, and then when you figure out where they are and get inside them, the cover comes off and you see the message, secret found. This message helps the player to contextualize the contents, even if it doesn't immediately register as something that someone would keep secret. In this case, we can see that the child's hiding something that he stole to play with he wasn't supposed to take. Uh, secrets and hiding are very compatible with environmental storytelling, so all the characters in Spider are designed as people with secrets and objects that they want to hide. Moving on to the kitchen. Uh, the first thing you encounter is this tray of food, which kind of implies that somebody is serving or caring for someone else. And there's some medicine here, which implies that the recipient might be sick. So medicine versus tinctures. These are both recurring props, but they're associated with two different story threads. We tried to make them visually distinct to signal the correct connotations. The medicine is supposed to look healthy. The tinctures are supposed to look nasty and like addiction. Uh, but they're too close. It's too easy to draw a spurious connection between them. And now we're back here, and you might ask yourself if that pepper shaker is supposed to be relevant, which is some slides I cut, so ignore that, but the pepper shaker is relevant. Um, then what about this other thing? It's just a cool prop that we found in real life. That's the only reason it's in the game. Um, almost every prop in Spider comes from some photo reference, and that's the major reason it's in the game, for authentic texture. Uh, what would be in this kitchen? What are cool, appropriate objects? But this kind of texture can become red herrings in the detective sense, spurious data that if you mine it for meeting, you can wind up with incorrect conclusions. And this like real data versus noise, texture, red herrings, is a really big topic in Spider. So one huge misstep I made along these lines is that I had three separate plot threads. They all involved coffins, and two of them involved replacing the contents of those coffins with rocks. But they're totally separate, and I didn't mean for you to draw connections. So this, <laughs> this is uh, confusing for people, short version. Um, so this kind of confusion is toxic to the player's detective process. There's like a tipping point where too much confusion has cascading effects, can cause players to tune out. What you really hope for is that things will land into place early to keep the player invested and also to eliminate some clues, taking them off the board, leaving fewer for the player to put together. But conversely, when players are pursuing a spurious connection, they're going down a dead end and eventually they're gonna to need to recognize that and rewind, putting those clues back on the board. It's bad news. So in Spider, we really like texture and we don't want it to be trivial to pick out a story clue. So we have a deliberately high rate of noise. But one thing I've learned is to stay consistent in that. So for example, players can come to the conclusion like that night thing might be a clue, but not necessarily in this game. Basically, you make an implicit with a contract with the player and you have to stick to it. And of course, it helps not to go out of your way to create problems. Um, one example of the consistency rule is this scene where, given the story here, there would realistically be so many overlapping layers of tracks and footprints that at first I chose not to depict them all, but that was inconsistent with my normal way of depicting clues, so players read it wrong, meaning that they correctly read the incorrect data that I had presented them. So after the scene read like this confusing mess before you, then it clicked easily for players, and this went against all of my instincts. As an aside, these marks right here um, we're confusing the players. They're supposed to be the heel marks uh, from a shoe, like heels being dragged, but that didn't click until we actually added the shoe. And this and many other uh, suggestions were brought to us by playtesters. Moving on to the guest bedroom. This is a room shared by two people, an adult, L.S. Bryce, and the pregnant lady, she's the pregnant lady, and her now-born child named T. Bryce. Uh, this room establishes firmly the outcome of the pregnancy. And even though it's a huge mansion, they're both like crammed in here, they share one bed, and that implies they're unwanted guests. Uh, we see a portrait of T. Bryce, the baby, with S.B. Blackbird. Um, he's being given a monkey doll by SB, and partially this is symbolic because T. Bryce is like a little monkey. He's always getting into things he shouldn't. Um, but of course, the monkey's a connection, and it later places T. Bryce in this creepy basement. And so I had hoped for it to feel like he carried this doll around for years to build a sense of fond relationship with SB, but we never see another portrait of him, so I couldn't express that. I only had one monkey doll propped to place, and this is where it had to be. And moreover, without any portraits, it's hard for people to be sure how old T. Bryce is when the game starts. Is he still a baby? So we added multiplication tables, which kind of calibrates that, you know, he's probably not three years old, but he's not an 18-year-old either. Let's call it like maybe seven to 10, which works perfectly. Uh, there's a lesson here about the importance of being able to visualize a scene correctly in your detective work. So before the multiplication tables, we had a lot of trouble with this scene directly above where you find the monkey doll. We wanted to imply that he climbed a stack of things to escape a window, but in order to visualize that, you have to imagine the correct size of kid, like large enough to climb, uh, but small enough to squeeze through. So what really tipped the, the scales in this case was these hand-printed footprints, which again helps with visualization. Um, in a dark closet in the guest bedroom is where 
LS keeps things she no longer needs, like T. Bryce's baby stuff, since he's grown out of that. And there's a trunk where she stashed her broken dreams and artifacts from her former life and memories she doesn't want to think about anymore. Cramming them way back in the corner, it's meant to be heartbreaking. So the vault is where we have DV's cane and bowler hat. Uh, this is his man cave. And it contains this portrait of a secret society, which shows a lot of things. It shows the robes they wear, uh, where they meet, which is a location you can visit in the game, and how they establish rank. Because the ones that are on the dais a little bit further up, they carry orbs with triangles in them, whereas the ones lower down on the floor carry orbs with squares in them. So there is such a thing as rank, and here's how you know what rank people are. In a different part of the vault, there's this safe, which has been carelessly pushed aside, uh, indicating there's more at stake than just treasure, raising the stakes relative to Spider-1. And uh, there's this dartboard, which is an unsubtle clue that DV dislikes someone with the name of Bryce, and so we can see how that might extend to our other Bryces in this game. And on the wall, we see papers where someone's trying to puzzle out some secrets of the secret society, and the candy wrappers indicate that it's DV doing this. Uh, this thing right here is a secret sliding wall. It's very Scooby-Doo. And uh, then it changes to this, which is a robe and an orb from the Secret Society. So players understood that the robe and orb belonged to someone of low rank in the Secret Society, but there's a lot of confusion here. And I had wanted it to be a cool reveal that DV was in a Secret Society, but it wasn't. Like, who belonged to or knew about the Secret Society was an extremely messy topic for players. And a big piece of the confusion was that, in my mind, the family was just the caretakers of the Secret Society's estate. But for many playtesters, they assumed that the family, like, was the Secret Society, and this was their estate. Um, and so, of course, they knew all the secrets, and they were all members and stuff. So to solve this problem and to signal a sense of mystery right off the bat, we just opened the game with this quote, which had been a tagline from our website. So there's lots more in the game, but I'm going to focus on just a few uh, most noteworthy moments. Um, this scene worked great at conveying that someone was spying on DV, and it introduced a mystery of who the spy was at a time that worked well for the story. Many players cite this as one of their favorite moments, uh, and it wasn't one of the anchor moments. Usually those are the ones that work best since they're originally conceived as being visually strong. I think this one works because the reveal is exciting, because you're just uh, in that room. And even though one-way glass is a hard thing to convey, the rest of that cubby clearly communicates a furtive operation. And of course, these photos are a great way to show DV going through a progression over time, which is normally hard to convey in environmental storytelling. And specifically, he's descending into insanity. Um, I was really excited to do an actual crime scene, but it didn't work that well, uh, and it's because it's a nexus of a lot of the things that are hard to get right with environmental storytelling. So most people understand that T. Bryce escaped through the window and that L.S. was the victim, but um, what's hard is sequencing events, building timelines, causality. It's supposed to be the case that T. Bryce was fleeing from D.V., and he ran to his mother for help, and then D.V. chased them both down to the basement, and then she helped her son escape, but she got caught instead. Um, but that's a whole lot of stuff to try to fit together in a sequence. And people have other ideas like, well, maybe L.S. was being held prisoner down here. And maybe T. Bryce came to try to rescue his mom, but he got caught. And so one solution was this level subtitle, A Last Stand. Um, so the summary about text and spider is that there's text all over the friggin' place, but it's usually used pretty subtly to provide a little bit more context and orientation. I only use it as an actual crutch in a couple places where player comprehension was really flailing, and I don't feel bad about it. Um, another problem with the kidnapping scene is it's not the archetypal kidnapping scene. Like, there's this weird replacement victim concept, and there's a lot of scene changes. Um, and being a deviation from the expected norm is also true of, like, the secret society and how they work, and the butler being in the family portrait. Um, I think archetypes can be great for helping the player understand, but I use them really sparingly because I believe that cliches are lame. The technical word for it. Um, since we're making a list, here are some things I've had a hard time depicting with environmental storytelling. We've already mentioned like timelines and causality. This tends to extend to character motivations, like the butler's cache of treasures. Like, why is he hiding them inside the house? Like, is his plan to come back and steal them later or something? Um, things that are missing are hard to convey because they're not on screen. So this perch is missing a mechanical blackbird that's supposed to be there, but without seeing the bird, players thought it might be like a handle or a lever. So we actually had to just like depict the bird on its perch like very nearby in the same scene. Um, and those two points together explain a recurring problem in the spider games. Uh, these places are always abandoned, but unless I literally put the corpse in the game, no player has any idea where all the characters went. So, for example, we saw that T. Bryce climbed out that basement window, but we don't know for sure if that was his final appearance in the story. 
Uh, there's a lot of things I regret uh, about Spider 2. Um, I think Spider 1's hooks were hookier. Spider 2 takes a little while to get going. Uh, Spider 2 is too close to Spider 1, which is part of that problem. Like, they both take place in abandoned mansions, and so I had already used my best material, in particular, to establish that it's an abandoned mansion. Uh, Spider 2 is kind of a lot. It's really stuffed full of ideas. It's a little bit of an overreach. Um, I probably fewer ideas with more stage time each would have helped with player comprehension. And it takes a really long time to compare clues in, in both games. Like, um, you know, if the clues are in separate levels, it, it's, you can't just flip back and forth between them. But there's one thing I really like, so I want to share with you my favorite moment, which is the dramatic conclusion of the game, or at least the climax. So first of all, there's these diagrams in the metagame of a time machine and a weather device, and these are actually player tools that you use to change whether it's day or night or rainy or clear in Blackbird Estate when you're playing the game. But then you actually find these as levels in the game, so they've actually been invented. Um, and you get to play around there. And then there's this corpse you find who you can examine really carefully and almost but not quite confirm that this is DV. But it can't be DV because DV is still alive. You've seen him in the window. He's up here with the kidnapped LS in the tower. So you make your way there, but when you arrive, they are both gone. And you chase DV down a trap door to arrive in his laboratory. And now we're going to dramatically attempt to play a video on PowerPoint. dramatically attempt to get our PowerPoint presentation. But it worked, okay. So what happened here? Did DV disintegrate himself, or did he actually invent time travel in his quest for eternal life? It's designed to be interpretable either way, and most players report being unsure which they most believe. Uh, and this pertains to the meaning of Spider, right, the Shrouded Moon, which is about mysteries and magic. What's real, what's not, and how you'd even know the difference, which is something that I believe is very relevant today. And there's plenty in the game that plays with this theme. There's the fate of LS, the quest for immortality, and the secret society's machinations and what's actually really going on behind their facades, which you get to go back and look at. And I really like that the player's ability to interpret what they see, the skill that they've been using throughout the game, is so relevant to this meaning, and it comes into play especially at the climax. So taking this even one step further, soon after the climax, as the game is wrapping up, you get exposed to increasingly strong hints that the story extends beyond the game and into the real world. And the starting point for that is that the Seeker Society is based on a historical one, and you can research them to connect the remaining loose ends in the game and discover the deepest secrets buried in the game, and also to learn the connections between the game and the actual out in the physical real world historical mysteries that the game is based on. And that's it. Um, I got three minutes for questions, if anybody has questions. And I'll take it in the take room. Thanks. Go ahead. No, go ahead. All right. Thank you for so much for the talk. I always find so much useful uh, knowledge from the talks that you do. Um, I kind of got a couple of talks, uh, questions if no one has any more, but my first one would be how much reworking do you do on the artwork? So I guess the art style was specifically chosen so you could iterate because you said playtesting is really important. Um, so do you do like a broad pass of the artwork and then kind of clean up on that as you go? But then that might also bring too much emphasis on players and have to do the playtesting all over again. And then how, how do you keep track of the connections? So say you kind of reference this doll in one of the pictures and you have him down in the basement, for example. Do you have some kind of spreadsheet like, okay, I've referenced this somewhere else. I need to get rid of that if I remove it from the basement. Like, do you keep track of that stuff? Yep. Um, so uh, the answer about process and art style, um, if it was more flexible, that would be great. Um, it's a little bit costly to change things, yeah. so that's one of the reasons for more advanced planning. It's not impossible, and we definitely do have to change things, and we hope to change small props, not like big parts of the set or whatever. Um, 
I feel like I had another point for you about that. Oh yeah, one of the problems is that a lot of this stuff is very, very nuanced, really specific direction, and it has a, a, a it tends not to come together until very close to the end. And so there's lots of like little tiny details missing that they're actually really important because players focus so much on everything because we're asking them to mine everything for so much data. And so it's the play test is actually is hard because of that. But you know you, you do your best with what you got. And the second question was about spreadsheet. No, nope, not quite that yeah. organized. But one thing that's handy is if you know something is like a hero prop and it's actually relevant to meaning. Yeah. If it's got a, you know, like the earrings, there's only one piece of art, and so that, you know, we just copy and paste the art kind of a sure. thing, and that helps a little bit. Okay. Well, uh, another question? Um, in my experience with sort of environmental or, or pull versus push storytelling, it seems like the strong, one of the stronger emotions is sort of this human voyeuristic tendency to want to see events or get knowledge mm -hmm. that they seems like they're not supposed to have. Does your sort of experience bear that out, and does that affect kind of what you sort of keyframe or pick as your sort of main moments that you want to make sure that you communicate? Yeah, I, don't, I didn't actually explicitly think about voyeurism uh, when designing either of spider stories, but so I also worked on the Thief series, and it's a big deal there, and I think that's because those are living humans that you get to watch, and so it's easier to design things that living humans are doing in front of you that are like fun and you feel sneaky when you're watching them or whatever. I think it's a little bit harder to build into props, but I'm sure that like some of that Thief experience kind of carried over. Like I didn't explicitly be like, you're going to go through this person's underwear drawer or anything <laughs> like that. But you know, if you're looking at, for example, their failing relationships, which is a common theme in Spider. I think that has a little bit of a voyeuristic sense, but it kind of a sad one. And now we're out of time, so I'll be in the wrap-up room. Thank you very much.